my pleasure to introduce our guest, Anna Minguzzi. She obtained her PhD at Pisa, but then she moved to France. She was working in Paris, now she's in Grenoble, and she's working uh, at uh, Laboratoire de Physique et Modélisation de Milieu Condensé. Uh, I'm using the French name because I was not sure about the English one, but this is a research unit devoted for theorists, and they have very nice resident at the academic for, uh, campus, they achieved what our uh, dream is of. And uh, Anna published more than 150 uh, papers that are very well cited. Uh, she's working on the many body quantum mechanics. And today she will tell us about uh, emerging field, which is uh, atom tronic. So Anna, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Cicek. It's a very, really a great pleasure uh, to be here uh, with you virtually today. So, and uh, I will um, present you today some works that we have been doing since several years in Grenoble about uh, some applications of atomtronics in uh, bosons and fermions on a ring with strong interactions. So first of all, as uh, I was, uh, as I'm, I am, uh, uh, so this is a colloquium. I prepared a few introductory slides and general facts about uh, the systems of study. So um, the ultra cold atoms we are interested in are extremely cold. Indeed, is uh, much more is like uh, uh, of nano Kelvin scale, and they are generated by. Um, I put here an image of a typical experimental apparatus. It's a very complicated setup, and they really tour the force to obtain it. So they are, in fact, uh, metastable gases. Uh, the true ground state would be a solid, but they are evaporated, starting from a solid. They are slowed down. Then they are trapped by some virtual uh, walls because they cannot touch any surface or they would uh, stick to it. And so this type of uh, virtual trappings are done by magnetic fields and combination with laser fields, optical potential. And they are slowly cooled down by various techniques. And one of them is called evaporative cooling. And is uh, uh, the one which allows to reach such low temperatures that we can get onto the quantum degeneracy regime. And we can assume that they are almost at thermal equilibrium. And so um, many of the methods, uh, theoretical tools that we usually use for equilibrium systems can be applied uh, to describe those systems. Although they have a few losses and uh, in a few second time, which is quite a long time scale, uh, they will uh, actually decay. Um, so they are also extremely dilute, so much, much more dilute than air. And uh, uh, as I said, they reach the, the, the quantum degeneracy regime has been reached in many experiments. So uh, the other aspects of the research that I want to present you today is uh, uh, falls into the realm of what is called as atomtronics. And in fact, this uh, name uh, puts together uh, various recent advances in the experiments and in the theory of ultra cold atoms, uh, where in particular we consider um, closed geometries uh, and we study some type of uh, current flows or transport flows in these systems. Um, the goal is uh, to identify new ways to characterize these systems, in particular thanks to the analysis of their out of equilibrium dynamics. And uh, um, among the main applications of this area, uh, we can mention, for example, that since we are using uh, boxes or rings, or other uh, flat geometries, this would be a new, sim new platform, platforms for quantum simulation. And also uh, one other interesting research line, which is not um, exactly pursued in our team, but it's also very interesting to know that they um, can be used as uh, um, new devices for quantum sensing. For example, they are sensitive to acceleration or rotation. And uh, in terms of tools, uh, we need to combine, uh, to take uh, into account that these systems are of finite size. So this is a, a, a domain that is called the mesoscopic physics. Uh, 
and uh, uh, we can uh, uh, take some uh, ideas from that area and also from condensed matter physics and we need to mix this with the, uh, the, the tools of ultra cold atoms. So um, this is a, a broad and emerging domain with uh, uh, many people involved. I am uh, focusing in particular on a very uh, specific setup, which is, uh, let's say, very idealized. That is the one of uh, bosons and fermions in one dimension, uh, confined on a ring. And uh, I will focus in particular on the effect of uh, what we call an artificial gauge field. I will come back to that. So to start with, uh, let me introduce uh, you the interacting bosons and the main theoretical uh, techniques that we, we use daily to describe these systems. So first of all, um, a word of caution, when we are describing one dimensional system, they are really very specific. And this is because uh, the one dimensional geometry is quite constraining as you can experience in everyday life. For example, when cars <laughs> queue in a, in a line. Um, so similarly, part quantum particles in an atomic waveguide, they cannot uh, circumvent each other. And this uh, has a, a very strong effect on interactions and uh, uh, makes uh, uh, them, uh, uh, let's say, naturally strongly correlated. Uh, the other aspect is that in one dimension, we can have this phenomenon of strat statistical transmutation. That means that somehow bosons behave like fermions. And uh, uh, I will give you an example of that. But let's say that in one dimension, the statistics and uh, some other properties are quite intertwined in a different way than in higher dimensions. So um, another, uh, let me first uh, um, be, uh, come back to the physics of these systems and tell you that, in fact, one dimensional systems are, of course, realized um, in uh, labs. And uh, the way to reach one dimensional conditions is that the, all the energy scales of the systems are smaller than a transverse confinement energy, such that uh, uh, transversally the systems are occupied the ground state. And then we have only longitudinal degrees of freedom that make the system essentially one dimension. In practice, in the experiments, they can have realized either a set of copies of many tubes, and this is achieved with optical lattices, with uh, uh, what we call two-dimensional optical lattices, that is, we have uh, lattice confinement in two directions and a very smooth confinement in the third direction, or also in uh, um, cheap traps where we exploit uh, um, electric current flowing on a wire to create a suitable magnetic field that can trap the atoms and create one single copy of these systems. Okay, so now that we have uh, agreed that um, this system are essentially one dimension, I will uh, from now on always forget the, the two extra dimensions, physical dimensions, and I will just focus on a one dimensional linear coordinate X, which describes uh, um, the properties of the particles. So um, particles uh, at ultra cold atoms in one dimension can be described by an effective interaction that is a one dimensional delta interaction. This because uh, uh, neutral atoms are uh, usually short ranged. So in this uh, way, I do not, I will not consider here other spe specific types of atoms like dipolar atoms, but uh, uh, most of the, like the alkali atoms I have uh, um, short range interactions and we describe them as delta interaction. And this actually realizes a beautiful model in, uh, um, in, in theoretical physics that is called the Lieb linear model. And this is actually an integrable model. Uh, if you have no external trapping, it's just a Hamiltonian of quantum particles of bosonic statistics on a line with delta interaction. So this model is integrable by a technique known as Bethe ansatz. But in most of the experimental circumstances, we also have some external potential, like, for example, this smooth potential in the longitudinal direction that can be harmonic one. But we can also have localized potential, like impurities or barriers. And in this case, the model is not integrable, and we have to develop specific theoretical schemes to describe it. 
so now, uh, one uh, important uh, quantity to characterize the strength of interaction in this system is the ratio between a, a typical interaction energy um, constructed with the density, one dimensional density times the interaction strength, divided by a typical intera a kinetic energy, that is the kinetic energy associated to the um, density of the particles in one dimension. So this makes uh, a quantity that we call gamma, and um, which is uh, all, uh, proportional to the interaction strength G and inversely proportional to the density of the particles. So we achieve uh, the regime of strong interaction by decreasing the density. And uh, this is quite unusual and different from the three-dimensional case. So uh, now um, let's see what happens if I uh, tune the interaction from uh, uh, we, uh, small values of uh, G of the interaction strength or uh, by tuning uh, uh, correspondingly the interaction parameter gamma and uh, tweak interaction, the system of bosons will be almost a Bose-Einstein condensate, but in fact will be a Bose-Einstein condensate with a fluctuating phase because uh, uh, quantum fluctuations are very important in one dimension. So we call this a quasi-condensate. On the other hand, if you, we increase the interaction very much, we go to repulsive re, re, regime. We go to a regime of strong interaction, which is a, we call fermionized regime, which is not a condensate. It's very far from uh, the, uh, let's say, weakly interacting Bose gas. So, and there is nothing special that happens in terms of phase transition in the uniform systems, but uh, the physics is very different in these two regimes and this and requires different theoretical approaches, which I will present you now. So um, starting from the weakly interacting regime, the typical theoretical description is ba based on a nonlinear Schrodinger equation called the gross pitayevsky equation. Uh, which is uh, an effective equation for a single wave function, the condensate wave function. And uh, uh, the interactions are included at the uh, mean field level, at heart rate level, in terms of this uh, nonlinearity G psi square in uh, term uh, added to the usual Schrodinger equation. Uh, this uh, uh, term, this nonlinearity, is very important to change the properties of the gas with respect to non interacting one. In particular, it, this can give rise to superfluidity or to solitons. And quite, what is quite non trivial is that even if we are in a dilute regime, interactions are important due to the, in the presence of an external confinement, due to the, let's say, balance of interaction and potential. So um, this makes a very strong effect of interaction, even if the uh, interaction parameter gamma is small. Um, then um, if we uh, turn the knob of interaction, which is actually possible in the experiments, and we increase the value of interaction, we start to enter to, into a regime which is a fully quantum. It's a regime where we cannot neglect the quantum fluctuations and we need a quantum theory to describe it. Uh, one, uh, typic one, one typical quantum theory that uh, we use is the one called the Lattinger liquid theory. And it's a, a quantum hydrodynamics theory, which is valid at low energy. Um, in practice, we introduce um, one field that is associated to the phase and the one field that is associated to the density fluctuations. And we describe um, the Hamiltonian of this system as a quadratic Hamiltonian in terms of these fields uh, phi and theta. Um, one first term is uh, the kinetic energy term is the uh, mass times the superfluid velocity square. And the second term is associated to interactions and it's associated to the uh, square of the density fluctuations. Uh, this uh, theory is uh, valid uh, for a whole range of uh, interactions and requires as an input two parameters that I circled in red, the sound velocity and the Lattinger parameter. So this uh, can be uh, accounted for by a microscopic calculation or an exact uh, calculation like the Petianzat for our specific case of bosons. 
um, I, let me also stress that uh, this theory assumes that the excitation spectrum of collective excitation is linear, so it's a phonon-like, so it's valid at intermediate and large interactions, um, but breaks down at very weak interactions. So uh, then uh, it's uh, interesting to uh, complete this toolbox of uh, theoretical methods by also uh, using another method that is an exact solution valid at infinitely strong interactions. This is based on an exact solution due to Marvin Girardot that uh, he demonstrated that the bosons with infinitely strongly repulsions can be mapped onto a Fermi gas. So to build the wave function of the many body wave function of interacting bosons, we start from a wave function of the non-interacting fermions in the same potential, and we ensure the symmetry under exchange of particles by adding a mapping function, this A, that uh, makes sure that the full uh, final wave function is symmetric under exchange of particles. Uh, in essence, in this regime, what was noted is what is illustrated in the picture, that if you increase interaction, so from uh, top to bottom is uh, the solution of a two-particle problem with increasing interaction, from top to bottom, I think uh, when you have delta interaction, you form a cusp in the wave function, and this cusp becomes deeper and deeper up to the point at infinite interaction where it, where it reaches a zero, so the wave function has a zero. And this red wave function is actually the absolute value of a fermionic wave function, which would have a node at a zero relative distance. So why this uh, uh, solution is interesting is because it's uh, um, valid, first of all, at uh, all energy and length scales. So it's complementary to the Lattinger liquid approach. It's also valid for inhomogeneous systems and it can be extended to treat not only the ground state, which is depicted in the figure, but also um, excited states uh, and uh, out, generally out of equilibrium dynamics. And it can be also generalized to describe density metrics of uh, finite temperature gases. So in, uh, why does it work is because in this regime, there is of infinite interaction. There is no more any energy or length scale associated to an interaction itself because it's infinite. We are in the so-called similar to the unitary Fermi gas in three dimension. And so the system essentially um, needs only as information the properties of uh, another system which has uh, the same density that is the system of a Fermi gas. So uh, this uh, infinitely interaction regime is called the Tonks-Girardot gas and will be used to compare and to benchmark the calculation at the finite interaction, which are approximate. So um, now that I have uh, finished my tour of all the techniques for uh, uh, bosons uh, with repulsive interactions, uh, let me make a general comment about uh, uh, what is the effect of interactions in one dimensional bosons and uh, uh, of the phase of the quantum fluctuations. So one uh, typical effect that I, I mentioned the, before um, is the absence of a true Bose-Einstein condensate. And this is because uh, phase fluctuations are uh, so large that destroy the true long range order is defined by the um, this first order correlation function, the one body density matrix. Um, it, we have although quasi long range order in the sense that this uh, uh, correlation, special correlation function decays as a power law. And the exponent of this power law is the Lattinger parameter that I introduced and the, the, which depends on interaction strength. So I have also put a picture of one of the early experiments illustrating, demonstrated with ultra cold atoms, the uh, effect of phase fluctuation. And in fact, um, when you have a phase fluctuation on a condensate and you release it from the trap, after expansion, um, phase fluctuation will turn into density fluctuation and will be visible in the images after expansion. And so the fringes in these images are uh, really a signature of the presence of phase fluctuations in the gas. Let me also mention that uh, as um, 
typical in quantum mechanics, um, phase and density are conjugate variables. And uh, in particular, this means that the density fluctuation also enjoy a similar power law decay with an exponent that is actually the inverse of the exponent of the phase fluctuations. Okay, so uh, now that we are ready on uh, one dimensional systems, let me move on the specificity of the atomtronics device that is to be in a closed geometry. And in particular, I will from now on focus only on rings. So there is um, also huge experimental activity in creating ring straps for atoms. And uh, uh, there have been several uh, demonstrations of uh, trapping of atoms onto a ring with various techniques over the years. And let me mention that there are um, many approaches. Essentially, you can create uh, some type of uh, uh, cylindrical trapping and intersect with some other um, planar confinement. And the, the current techniques are very well advanced and can create very smooth traps of uh, very controllable. So right now there is uh, not yet an experiment realizing um, one dimensional uh, uh, tight transverse confinement, but this is uh, in progress. Um, so anyway, in general, uh, there are, we have a, a, a large palette of possibilities for creating ring traps. And uh, another important and essential ingredient that was demonstrated is that onto a ring trap, we can also plug a localized variant potential realized with a, a, a laser field, uh, such that we uh, locally, we can create a, a a dip in the density, and we can also steer the, this density, this dip, in order uh, to set the atoms into rotation. So this is one example where um, the, um, the set into motion of a barrier creates what we call a, an artificial gauge field. That is the, the equivalent of a magnetic field applied to neutral particles. There are various other schemes to create, to set the particles into rotation, like uh, some types of face imprinting or uh, other methods. But for the sake of simplicity, I will focus now on this uh, rotating barrier. So the result of this is that uh, the Hamiltonian of the system of bosons uh, under the ring uh, in under rotation can be, uh, has a, a correction in the kinetic part and it is a vector potential. And also, of course, uh, we have uh, interactions and if needed, an external potential. So um, the fact of setting the particles into rotation creates uh, currents and uh, um, the system is then described in the framework of persistent currents. So um, these uh, circulating currents are not uh, only uh, superflows for bosonic system, but are in general a signature of quantum coherence over the whole ring and can be also observed for fermionic systems, as I will show you in the last part of the talk. Um, so um, in particular, uh, the persistent currents can be described as follows. If I uh, look at the energy of the ground state energy of this uh, system as a function of the strength of this artificial gauge field, which is, uh, for example, proportional to the angular velocity of rotation of the particles uh, on the ring, uh, then I uh, see that these energy um, levels are periodic and each branch is a set of parabolas, each branch corresponding of a state of a given angular momentum. Um, there is actually a theorem due to Leckett that says that uh, uh, this type of uh, energy landscape holds for any repulsive interaction strength. And it's actually due just to the fact of uh, the, uh, say, quantization of angular momentum and the angular momentum conservation on a clean ring. And the persistent currents are actually defined as the derivative of this uh, ground state energy with respect to the artificial gauge field that I will denote by omega. So now um, there is a very important conceptual point that uh, to let angular momentum enter in the system, 
we need actually to mix a little bit the energy levels, and this can be done, for example, in the presence of the barrier. So if I add a small barrier, the energy landscape uh, is changed in uh, what follows. We have a small gaps opening at uh, um, the points where angular uh, momentum uh, levels uh, would be would, where they generate. So in this case, um, the uh, persistent currents are not anymore a sharp sawtooth, but are slightly smoothened sawtooth. And this actually corresponds to what is maybe more familiar is when we change frame and go to the lab frame, it's a, um, a stepwise increase of the current, which is proportional to angular momentum. Sorry. Okay, uh, so uh, I will. Um, I have decided to present you um, three main results in the remaining part of the talk. Um, they are a little bit historical. So the first one in particular is the result that we, ach we have achieved uh, a few years ago, but it, I decided to present it because it's the um, starting point of, uh, of, the, of our analysis on rings, and uh, it illustrates many uh, non-trivial effects of interactions in this system. So essentially what we have studied is uh, um, the effect of interaction in this amplitude of persistent currents, in the way these uh, uh, jumps are smoothened due to the effect of the presence of the barrier. So uh, there is one uh, effect, is expected effect is that uh, when you increase uh, the barrier strength, uh, the amplitude of the currents decreases. And this is quite uh, uh, natural, let's say because you open up a bigger and bigger gap in the energy spectrum. But there is a surprising effect is that this type of, uh, of, uh, of gap opening depends actually on interactions in a very non-trivial way. And this has allowed us to learn on how a fluid adapts to interaction, to, to uh, adapts to a barrier in, uh, on a ring. So, um, for example, um, one can very um, easily calculate the amplitude of uh, uh, this persistent current for non-interacting particles, because these are bosons and it's just uh, all the bosons share the same quantum state. And, uh, all, and so this gives a value in this curve of the persistent current amplitude as a function of the interaction strength. But we do not actually know what happens in all the rest of the diagram. A second point that we can um, easily fix is the limit of infinite interaction is the up uh, uh, the, the, the second green line on the curve. Uh, and this uh, the case where we map onto, uh, we use the Girardot solution to map onto non-interacting fermions. And we can calculate an effective barrier that the bosons see when they are so strongly interacting as behave like fermions. Uh, the rest of the curve is uh, really quite hard to get. So we, we advanced in two steps. Uh, we advanced actually backwards. So we start from a strong interaction and we decrease the interactions. And uh, it is possible to obtain this result by using the Lattinger liquid theory, because we can write down the effect of the barrier in Lattinger liquid theory. And what we obtain is that the um, uh, quantum fluctuation of the density uh, actually dress, uh, renormalized the barrier strength with the power law decay. And that means that if uh, I, um, now let's look at the, the right way from intermediate to strong interactions, uh, phase fluctuations increase uh, density and phase are conjugate variables, density fluctuation decrease. So the density fluctuation will dress less and less the barrier and it, they will reach, they will be closer to an effectively larger barrier at strong uh, interactions. So this is an example of how quantum fluctuation can dress a barrier potential. Now let's go to uh, maybe more familiar for some of you, the weakly interacting regime. Um, it's the regime where instead we describe the system neglecting the quantum fluctuations. In that case, we can use the Grosby-Dayevsky theory. Uh, 
And we can actually found the exact solution for this uh, uh, problem with the uh, delta barrier. And we find that the ground state is a soliton, a pin that the barrier potential. And so thanks to this uh, solitonic solution, we can calculate the persistent current amplitude. And the two uh, solutions are illustrated in the bottom figure, weak uh, interaction in black and the strong interaction in blue, and they actually match and they meet at intermediate interaction where both of them fail. Um, this, uh, this uh, let's say, theoretical analysis where, where was complemented by numerical simulation done by our collaborators um, and uh, uh, confirmed the completely this picture for a wide range of barrier strengths from uh, weak to strong barrier from top to bottom. And uh, in both, in all cases, we found that there is a, a maximum of the currents at intermediate interaction, as, which, are, which is essentially a competition between a classical screening on the side of uh, weak interaction and the effect of quantum fluctuation on the side of strong interaction. So what do we learn is that um, the nominal value, value of the barrier strength uh, is not the one that the fluid sees because the fluid dresses the barrier. It screens or dresses by quantum fluctuation. And this has to be taken into account if you want to perform a quantum state manipulation, for example, or if you want to study simply transport across a barrier. So this was uh, uh, one first uh, example of uh, one of our results. Now um, let's uh, move to a more recent result that is uh, um, actually uh, the fate of a current state. So now- Can you possibly ask the question concerning the last slide? Yes, of course. Yes, please. Uh, uh, I'm puzzled by this relation to the Hawking. I mean, if you have a rotating system, okay, the quantity which depends on the state of a rotation is a moment of inertia of it. And the whole the, the situation you describe reminds me something which is, as far as I remember, pretty well understood in the nuclear physics, that when you have a nu rotating nuclei, that at a certain state of a rotation, the rotation destroys the ordered phase of a nuclear matter, call it superconducting, and it goes into a normal flow. And that, that is a phenomenon which is even having a Swedish name, Erast line. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have no focus idea what this word means. I, I knew once, but I've forgotten. Mm -hmm. It's a Swedish word anyway. And uh, so that, that, that these curves have a certain reminiscence because if you have that drawings, then surely the moment of inertia of the whole system changes more or less following the picture you're drawing. And therefore, uh, we, we, depending on this interaction strength, as you plot, the moment of inertia changes. So you so you, you 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 have the macroscopic effect which is happening. Uh, yes. So um, I um, may. Uh, so is the question finished? Uh, may I? No, no, I finished. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. 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 No. No. Sorry. It might yes. be completely wrong. I mean, but I mean that if something is rotating, the something must happen, and is changing. The something must happen to the moment of inertia. Be whatever you call it, you, yes. call it a, a, you call it Latinger fluid or whatever. I mean, it has to have a moment of inertia. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So yeah. So the, for the first part of your question about the analog of Hawking effect, in fact, uh, the phenomenon of uh, barrier renormalization is very general, and uh, and also holds if you are on a, on a linear geometry where you it's maybe easier with because it is not actually related to this uh, rotation it's just a barrier renormalization and then uh, um, the way uh, you may uh, uh, push a fluid against an obstacle and then having it accelerated and creating some excitations but the second part of your question is actually very right about um, the issue of uh, having angular momentum entering in the system and finding the state uh, 
uh, we, I think the erast is the state of uh, uh, maximal angular momentum at a given energy. Uh, so um, it was discussed by Masahito Ueda and Rina Kanamoto and co-workers um, before our work. And they made a specific link between these uh, rotating one dimensional bosons and the rest states. Uh, what we added is the presence of a barrier potential, uh, which uh, um, somehow mixes the angular momentum states. And so is uh, even, uh, let's say, more advanced than to make the link with this type of states. But uh, essentially, essentially, uh, it is uh, the 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 idea is right. So the there is another way to represent these uh, energy levels in such a way that can be mapped onto the ERAST picture. Did, does that answer your question? Oh, I'm sorry for interrupting. No, 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 thanks. Actually, it's a very nice uh, to, to, have, uh, to have comments. So thank you, thank you very much, yes. Okay, so now I am going to study, um, to present you our study on uh, uh, the decay of a current flow. So um, now we consider a different protocol. So we imagine that we imprint a current state on a ring and uh, we used a barrier uh, to stop this flow. So now we want to, to understand, depending on the interaction regimes, uh, on the effects of uh, fluctuations of thermal or quantum nature, what would happen to this initially prepared current state. So and for, uh, to be specific, we imprint uh, one quantum of circulation that corresponds to this uh, phase uh, map plotted on the right part of the picture. And then we follow the dynamics of the average current and we want to see what happens. So essentially a few things can happen. Uh, the current can oscillate between state angular momentum one and minus one because they have the same energy, but also it can decay onto a state without current. So, and we are going to understand uh, when and uh, when either one of the two scenarios happen. So, um, and for that as well, we have used uh, various uh, theoretical techniques. So to describe uh, the weakly interacting gas, we used the gross pitayevsky equation. And uh, this plot shows uh, the current as a function, integrated current as a function of time uh, for various choices of barrier strength lambda. So on the top of the figure is a very weak barrier. On the bottom of the figure, where we have these uh, triangular jumps, is a very, very strong barrier. And uh, what we see is a, a sudden change of trend. So if the barrier is small, uh, very small, uh, essentially the current continues to flow and uh, there are no oscillations. Then at, the, at some point, we see oscillations emerging and the current oscillates around its zero value. And actually, um, this reminded me something that um, we worked on together with Krizyuk a long time ago, and it's the Josephson effect. And it turns out that um, this is uh, not, a, um, not a coincidence. This uh, transition of regimes between a, a state of the current with very small oscillations and essentially uh, fixed to some value close to one or oscillations around zero is exactly the same as what is observed in the Josephson effect when you have transition between self-trapping and the Josephson oscillations. And this, what we actually demonstrated is that we can map our problem to a dual of a Josephson effect where instead of having uh, oscillation of particles in balance between two wells, we have oscillation of uh, two angular momentum states. And so uh, we actually were able to provide a, a completely detailed uh, analysis of uh, these oscillations using exactly the concept of the dual of the Josephson effect. So now what happens to these oscillations when I turn on the temperature? So these are the results of stochastic projected the gross pitayevsky equation done by our collaborators in Paris. And what we see is that um, there is still some uh, 
uh, almost self-trapped or oscillating or, or Joseph's oscillations, but in both cases, uh, it, uh, the, the current decays. So then we have explored why the, the, do the, this current decay and what is the macroscopic mechanism. And for that, we- Can I interrupt again? Yes, yes, uh, sure. In this analogy with Josephson effect. Yes. I, I mean, what plays the role of, what will be the analog of the voltage and current in this moment? I uh, mean, if I oh. think about the Josephson effect, I mean, I plot the current and, and voltage characteristics of the, of the junction, right? Yes. What would be the pick or, I mean, they are different than what the drawings we are showing. <laughs> yes, that's true. Yes. So, um, in fact, this is uh, um, closer to what we call the Bose Josephson effect. That is the Josephson effect realized with uh, ultra cold atoms. And so, this is uh, um, so let's say that this is the case where uh, you create the equivalent, the equivalent of applying a volta voltage is that we create some imbalance among the two wells. And this imbalance is then created by other means in the ultra cold atoms experiment. It's not a, a So voltage. there is no characteristic. But so, the, yes, yes, so yes. In a sense, the, it's overusing the word Josephson effect. No, no, it's a Feynman. In the Feynman book, there is the explanation of the simplest explanation of the Josephson effect yes. using, um, yes. Uh, but, but, yeah, I mean, that we know, I mean, but. Uh, yes. But, uh, that, so, uh, but, yes. but there's, I mean, in this sense, you can even explain a, a Josephson effects using the 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 fixed axle in a car between the two the rear x i mean in a classical very classical engineering there is a one kind of a suspension of the tires in the in a car with the back with the back sus powering when when the back wheels are powered and that precisely is the the angular momentum balance between those wheels have the characteristic, which looks like a characteristic of a Josephson effect, but the, but the, the Josephson effect is something more. I mean, it's... Uh, uh, yeah, so here we really exploit the quantum tunnel. So this is really very close. Yeah, in this well, yeah but so there is a, okay. Well, anyway, that was just a comment. So now okay. I am, thank you. No, I, so yeah, yes. So I, first of all, I fully agree that, that you can write the classical equation for relative uh, in, for population imbalance and uh, I don't know some equivalent of relative phase. But uh, let's say um, so. I don't, I'm not uh, at all experienced in your uh, in your example, but in the current study. The, uh, it's really very close of the Josephson uh, spirit. It will maybe more clear. I have uh, a slide with the Josephson Hamiltonian in, in, a few, in a few moments, but let me just mention briefly that it's really a, a, a coherent tunnel effect, what we describe. So in this sense, it's very, very close to the Feynman description of Josephson effect where he describes the two parts of a superconductor with two microscopic wave functions. And the Josephson effect is related to the dynamics of the phase difference and on the population imbalance of the two parts of this superconductor. So in this spirit, I believe that the Josephson effect name is completely appropriate. Okay, so uh, let me, uh, yeah, so this was a regime of, uh, a weak interaction and we observed the uh, decay of the current. So, um, and then to, to understand what happens and what makes this current decay, we looked at the uh, single trajectories of our uh, numerical simulation. And uh, for example, this is a, um, a space time plot of the density and the phase of the condensate. And uh, the barrier is position at the central, uh, in the middle of the figure, the black central line. And so, and the, on the upper plot, we plot the current as a function of time. And we see that at some point, this current uh, jumps from average value one to average value zero. 
And in correspondence of this jump, there is actually something that happens in uh, the uh, density and phase of the condensate that is really striking. And this, uh, this, in this uh, uh, yellow um, circle here, we have a, a phase slip occurring, a phase jump. And also this jump happens when um, you, I hope you have enough resolution to see that there are many stripes in the density. Um, one of those stripes, some of those stripes are uh, wiggles like uh, phonons, sound excitation. Other stripes are solitons, and you recognize them from the fact that they have a smaller slope with respect to the others because the soliton propagates uh, slower. And uh, so we have at some point that one of those solitons hits onto the barrier and goes back. At this moment, um, the soliton velocity vanishes, the density vanishes, and in that point, we can have angular momentum entering or exiting the system. And uh, in this case, we have, we miss an ang a quantum of angular momentum and the current goes from value one to value zero. So this is an example of a thermally activated phase slip. And uh, this is the origin of the decay of the current at finite temperature in the weakly interacting regime. Um, then um, let's see what happens at strong interaction. So I will use again the, um, the quantum model, the Lattinger liquid Hamiltonian. In this way, I introduce rotation as uh, um, this artificial gauge field omega. And I describe the barrier by an effective term that is uh, um, written uh, um, here. It's the cosinus of the field theta. The field theta is associated to the density fluctuation. And so to answer your question about the Josephson effect, we see that the barrier in this uh, formalism is described as the cosinus of a phase. That is exactly what we do for Josephson effect. But actually, here it's, uh, uh, we are looking at the dual of the Josephson effect. So we have to exchange a phase and density somehow. And in fact, this is the theta field associated to density modulations. So um, then um, using this method of the Lattinger liquid, what we can do is to actually reduce our initial many body problem onto an effective problem for a Josephson junction in the presence of a bath. In fact, all the phonon modes that are in the Lattinger liquid theory uh, create a sort of harmonic bath for the junction. And uh, in particular, we can predict that, that this bath under certain uh, conditions, um, in particular, it depends on the, on the value of the parameters of the tunnel energy of the junction. And uh, let's say of uh, uh, the, the quantum energy scale associated uh, to the angular momentum, and depending on the ratio of these two terms of the Josephson junction Hamiltonian, uh, we can have that uh, these bath modes uh, can dump out the oscillations. And this was another work that we had done uh, a few years ago. And we, where we were predicting Josephson oscillation could be damped by the intrinsic uh, phonon modes uh, of the system. Um, there is also another regime that is actually the most exotic one and the last one of this, uh, um, of this uh, work. And is the regime where actually we have a coherent oscillation of angular momentum states quantum coherent, and this is called uh, coherent quantum phase slips regime. And it was a terminology introduced in the context of the uh, Josephson junction by uh, Yuli Nazarov and collaborators. So um, essentially, while the Josephson effect is a coherent transfer of population, the coherent quantum phase slip regime is a coherent transfer of vortices or fluxes. And that's what we see when we are in the quantum regime of the Josephson junction. That is when the Josephson tunneling energy is much smaller than this quantum energy EQ. In this regime, we uh, may have coherent oscillation of angular momentum states. 
this is actually in a regime where uh, Josephson Junction would work as a flux qubit. It has been the, uh, called the Equid, Atomtronic Quantum Interference Device. And uh, most interestingly in this regime, the bath has no effect because the phonon spacing is too large. And uh, so uh, this uh, Lattinger liquid model predicts the existence of this regime. And uh, we observe it in the um, exact solution at infinite interactions. And this is illustrated in this plot as a current as a function of time. And uh, for a small uh, barrier, we see this type of oscillations. And quite remarkably, if we look at the frequency of the excitation modes, this pink line, uh, we see that it is uh, increasing linearly with the barrier strength, and this is exactly the Lattinger liquid prediction. And moreover, since we have access to the full many body wave function, we can actually see uh, the effect of multiple particle hole excitation, and we can see how these uh, coherent quantum phase leaps uh, um, would, uh, let's say, evolve or be more complicated in the description uh, when we increase the barrier strength. So then uh, in the last five minutes, if I am allowed. Yes, yes, you can continue. Okay, um, I would like to present our work on fermionic, recent work on fermionic matter. And uh, uh, in this case, we have uh, uh, focused on the case of fermions on a lattice. Uh, the physics is uh, actually very close we, because we are working on a, on a lattice that's a small filling, but uh, um, the use of a lattice uh, is uh, practical for quantum simulation, for, for doing the classical simulation of this, uh, of this system. So in the, in the case of fermions, we have considered a, a system of two components, a spin up and spin down with the interactions that are attractive. U, uh, the, the constant U is negative. And we have uh, uh, these uh, on-site interactions between up and down uh, uh, spins, while there is no interaction between up, up and down, down uh, fermions because uh, fermions do not have uh, contact interactions. Um, so then we uh, uh, describe the presence of the artificial gauge field through the pile substitution. That is, we included this in a complex tunnel amplitude among uh, lattice sites. And essentially what we aim at studying is uh, uh, to probe what is known as the BCS-BC crossover, that is a change of regime of um, um, interaction strengths where you can have either paired fermions in the form of a Cooper pairs at a weak attractive interaction to the regime where the attraction are so strong that the pairs will be tightly bound and form a Bose-Einstein Bose condensate of pairs. And so we are going to study the current flowing on the ring across this BCS-BC crossover. And uh, uh, this shows some typical results of simulation uh, as well as calculations uh, solving uh, the beta ansatz uh, equations for this model. So the simulations are the dots, uh, are the triangles, uh, and the, the continuous lines are the Betianza solution. And we, I show the energy levels as a function of the artificial gauge field. So there is uh, something really evident when I increase the interaction from, uh, let's say, first to last panel of the first column. And that is, we have a doubling of periodicity. So the response of the system is doubled. And this is due to the formation of pairs, because this is exactly the same behavior as look at the yellow curves on the right um, part of the figure. This is the prediction for interacting bosons with twice the mass. So essentially, when the particles behave, appear together and behave as bosons, uh, the current have a very clear signature of it, and it's uh, in the response to artificial gauge field. So this is a very uh, simple example or how you can probe some phases of matter using uh, currents. So now um, another uh, point that I would like to illustrate with this specific example of uh, 
fermions, but it holds also for bosons, is uh, how one could uh, read out a current state in this type of uh, atomtronics devices. And the key idea is that every time that you have a flowing current, you have, uh, uh, that means that the fluid has a, a phase gradient. And all type of phase gradients are usually visible by interferometry. So we consider it a setup that is, was also used for, uh, um, uh, for experiments in, uh, uh, in um, fatter rings that is uh, observe the interference between an expanding disk and the ring. So, and then the overall interference pattern will be the sum of a single uh, interference of um, each dot on the ring and the central disk. So for example, let's say for the site number three, this will be this type of interference fringes. Next uh, um, site, site label number two is these fringes. Look, uh, please carefully at the fringes, they are almost the same. Uh, but in fact, they are slightly drifting outwards. So let me show it again. So take for reference, for example, the blue last uh, line. They are drifting outwards. Um, and this is because uh, um, the, phase dif the relative phase among the different points on the ring and the disk is slightly different. And when you combine all this, you have a beautiful spiral pattern emerging and um, which co contains both information on the sign and circulation of the current flow. So this is the example of, uh, the, of the spiral interferogram for uh, one single particle with angular momentum one. Uh, now, um, what happens uh, if you have uh, use bosons or if you use fermions and you calculate this type of patterns? And so, for example, um, while all bosons occupy a single quantum state and you have a perfect spiral, fermions occupying a fermisphere will have a much co more complicated uh, pattern, including dislocations. So this is an example of two fermions which display one dislocation. And there is also another interesting aspect of this type of readout is that uh, we can also learn about the effect of uh, um, of interaction in the system. And uh, this calculation shows the difference between a non-interacting Fermi gas on the left and the attractive fermions on the right. And you see that uh, when you have a strong attractions and then uh, you have a rearrangement of energy levels, then it's clearly visible also in these spiral interferogram patterns. So this is an example on how uh, these interference fringes can carry information on the nature of the quantum state. Okay, so this brings me to my conclusions. I have shown you um, that uh, uh, ultra-cold atoms on a ring can uh, have a very accurate response to artificial gauge fields, and one of them is rotation, that there are strong effects of interaction, and then uh, currents can be used to pr probe quantum phases. And then I have given you three examples of a properties of interacting bosons or fermions on the rings, the barrier renormalization, uh, the dual of the Josephson effect, and the probe of the BCS-BC crossover. And um, um, in perspective, well, this field is completely emerging and uh, there are uh, many other things to understand so about the strongly interacting low dimensional gases like uh, more on multi-component systems, uh, address full quantum dynamics, and other issues about the thermalization and transport. And I have also put uh, two other recent results that we didn't have the time to cover, that it's about um, spectral function and uh, shock waves uh, in one dimension. So I uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I am available if there are questions. So thank you, Anna. Uh, there were some questions during this talk, but now we have uh, time for additional two questions. So please. Actually, I wanted to ask, because the name atomtronic is clearly borrowed from electronics. And then uh, do you think it will there will be real devices using these atoms as electrons? I mean, there are some uh, plans to for technologies 
Yes, so but of course it's an, will not be on your uh, like on your desktop, not now. But uh, uh, there are uh, really very useful application already working on already sold on gravimeters, for example, because uh, massive particles are of course sensitive on gravity. And then uh, um, by uh, using, there are transportable ultra cold atom devices where, where atoms are in some form of harmonic potential, for example, and by studying the way these, uh, um, these uh, atoms, uh, the dynamics of these atoms um, in proximity of, uh, for example, of a variation of uh, gravitational masses, like, uh, for example, uh, oil or water or uh, uh, cavities underground. There are people who develop specific devices uh, using uh, ultra cold atoms as gravimeters. So this is already something, uh, something realized in practice, yes. Okay. And possibly, possibly also rotation okay. sensors. So, so rotation sensors, there are other candidates, but uh, uh, this is another interesting direction. This will use this uh, 1D physics or? Um, you can, uh, for the moment, uh, correl strong correlation are not needed and uh, not employed. And this is, but uh, essentially it's uh, um, one particle effects that are used in the current devices. Then in Outlook, of course, what we would like to do is to outperform the classical sensitivity by by using interactions but and uh, to the best of my knowledge this is not yet uh, to uh, the device stage this is uh, uh, future uh, research okay thank you maybe la last question in case i i have not exhausted all the available time for once uh, i i would like to make a comment and ask the question concerning this Josephson effect. Yes. And uh, the uh, it took me a while to recall, but now I sort of sorted in my head the point. Almost a almost a half of a century ago, there was a suggestion by Phil Anderson, and uh, uh, that you can observe a Josephson effect in two beakers of superfluid helium. Yes. Affected by a small orifice. And then there was an experiment. If I recall it correctly, the name of experimentator was Bill Cochran uh, from Case Western. And the experiment is such that you have a two beakers with a superfluid helium. There is a little hole in between. And there is a sound a uh, transducer next to the orifice. And then if you write a proper Hamiltonian, the, at that time, nobody uses the word the Lattinger fluid. It was just a simple, what was called the quantum hydrodynamic equations by Lev Landau. Now, of course, we, we, we do not mention even that that was basically all of that was, well, anyway. The, the, that was uh, that was Hamiltonian, and if you write that Hamiltonian, it it looks exactly almost like what you had written, and the angular momentum is played by the vorticity in the liquid because the phase slip phase slipped, which is happening, is due to the fact that there is a vor one of the quantum Feynman Onsager Feynman. Uh, the vortices going over the orifice. And when the vor quantized vortices goes over the orifice, it takes the face with it. Mm -hmm. So there is a face slip and the Josephson oscillation, I mean, this, this face, this, this current voltage diagram I was asking you already is related to the fact that it, the vortices has a core and the core is uh, having a normal component in it and therefore it takes also some matter through the hole and therefore a, a level of a liquid in a beaker from which the vortex disappears, drops a little bit. And the changes in the, in the, in the heights of the levels 
of the of the liquid in both of those beakers oscillates like the uh, like the Josephson effect. But the Hamiltonian, uh, I mean, I don't have that paper ready <laughs> at home, but uh, but you. That, I mean, that, that was in a physical review, so you can easily find it. And as far as I remember, the, the potential coupling, the, the barrier, the periodic barrier was basically the same. So. Okay, that, thanks. So, um, in fact, uh, um, many of the, uh, yes, there is a very close analogy between the liquid helium and the ultra cold atom systems. The observables are a little bit different due to this fact that we, one can use uh, atom, atom, atomic physics uh, techniques uh, for imaging, for example. Uh, um, but uh, I, I agree the physics is the one of uh, hydrodynamics. Now, uh, let me stress that what we call Latin liquid is the one dimensional uh, quantum hydrodynamics, because in one dimension, uh, we then we can um, ex write in an exact way uh, the field operator in terms of these uh, in these um, hydrodynamic fields, and moreover, with within Latin liquid, let's say we also mean calculation of some correlation functions. So, but I fully agree that uh, the uh, same level of approximation is the same as quantum hydrodynamics. That's why I mentioned it and uh, also the analogy with liquid helium. So thank you for, uh, for this talk.